Chapter 2 Growing Disillusionment Hey, do you have a bill? Those were the first words from a guy I met as we stood in the Dallas offices of Morgan Stanley in 1996, almost a decade into my time at the world-class white shoe firm. By that point, I was the bona fide star of the entire Southwest region. This guy, however, was so much more. He was a master of the universe, descending on us from Morgan's New York headquarters. Dan Waters carried himself like a champion thoroughbred, held an MBA from Harvard, and was laser-focused on winning. I had 800 clients who had entrusted a combined $160 million to me by this time, and I was feeling pretty proud of myself. When I got the chance to introduce myself to him, though, he asked me, Hey, do you have a bill? Sure, I said, reaching for my wallet and taking out a single dollar bill that I then handed to him. No, you idiot! A billion under management, he shot back. Me thinking, go screw yourself. That was pretty insulting. But telling him, no one has a bill? And he said, why don't you? Why don't you have a bill? I had no real answer for him except I never even dreamed of aiming so high. As brokers, our expectations were to bring in maybe $100 million to manage, yielding a million dollars per year in gross commissions and taking home $400,000 per year. That qualified as a great life. But a billion dollars? When the thoroughbred said that to me, it really hit me. The why not of it got me thinking differently. Why in the world don't I have a billion dollars under management? And why is his question so offensive to me? Maybe I had been thinking too small, while other guys with half my smarts were operating on a scale ten times as large as mine, their compensation commensurate with those heights. That lesson applied to my broader life as well, making me wonder whether I was settling for just okay and failing to challenge myself to step up and make more of an effort at everything in my life. I had always been motivated less by money and more by my desire to help regular people by investing their money to allow them to reach higher levels of financial comfort and safety. One of my first clients was Burl Phelps, who stayed with me for 27 years after retiring from ConocoPhillips. He was able to live well thanks to his pension and a $500,000 retirement account, until he passed in 2018 at age 94. I still manage the account for his family, because I appreciate the faith and trust he put in me long ago. Still, a notion began taking shape in my mind. My client roster, supposedly focused on serving individual investors, had grown so large as to be impersonal. It's not as though I had established emotional bonds with all my clients— I had signed up too many of them to be able to do that any longer. I had brokers under me handling much of the personal contact, and for most clients I didn't know the names of their children or the specifics of how they had earned their wealth unless I checked the notes I had scribbled into their entries in my daytimer. A creeping, awkward sense of embarrassment began to take hold of me, and I couldn't shake it. Nobody knew whether or not we were making our clients' lives any better. This unnerved me to no end. Wall Street sells the lie that we provide individualized service, that we take care of you and we care about you. But how many people can each broker realistically know and care about and study and analyze? I figure the maximum efficient total may be, say, a few dozen. That's it. Yet by that point, I had 800 clients under my watch. Who the hell is this guy? All of this crystallized in me on one particular day a few months after the Do You Have a Bill exchange with the Morgan Stanley Thoroughbred. I got a surprise call from one of my clients. His voice was gravelly and thickly deep Texas, and he launched into his spiel without introducing himself. Him. And I just gotta tell you what a great job you've done for me. Me. Well, thank you, sir. Who the hell is this guy? Him. You did exactly what you said you would do. You put me in Florida Progress stock. And, Ed, we haven't talked at all. That darn thing's doubled. That was great. Except at the time I was thinking about how this man believed I cared about him. And I couldn't even conjure up his name. 
This was in the days before caller ID, so I punched a few keys on the Quotron machine to call up my clients who had FPG in their accounts. Even once I found his name, though, I still didn't know him. I felt like a fake, and suddenly I realized what a liar I was. These clients thought I was looking after their accounts. They believed I was concerned about them, and for well over half of them, I didn't even know who they were. Shame on me, yes, and shame on Wall Street. I wanted to remake myself into a higher form of financial advisor, managing billions of dollars instead of millions, and imbued with a deeper knowledge of the markets and their most sophisticated secrets. Think Neo and the Matrix Reloaded. Now the man can fly. By this time, I was well aware of a stark difference between the conversations we brokers were having with our clients and the conversations taking place between the really high-end financial advisors and their clients. At the retail level, we were talking about mutual funds, municipal bond funds, and the like. In the higher realm of wealth management, the really smart people weren't talking about mutual funds. They were talking about collars, spreads, straddles, ratios, and liquidity needs. They were speaking this sophisticated language while I fielded calls from a retired Texan asking whether he would get his dividend payment on a Tuesday or a Thursday. He could remember only that he came on a tea day. It felt like the rank-and-file brokers were speaking Mandarin, the most common language in China, and the high-end advisors were speaking Cantonese, the country's more exotic variant. I wanted to learn that other language. The next morning, I set out on a drastic change, of course. I did something almost no broker would do. I gave away most of my client base. I grabbed a stack of new account cards listing contact information for my latest signups and started handing them out to the pleased but puzzled brokers all around me. Ultimately, I handed off fully 70% of the client roster I had cultivated and tended to for almost a decade. I even gave up my father's account— after he had ticked me off with that joke about dying before getting any chance to spend the assets that I had doubled for him. I handed the account to a broker who had been an usher at my wedding. Shedding more than 500 accounts freed me up to pursue investors with accounts that were bigger, far bigger. It was exhilarating and cathartic for me, a fresh start on something entirely different. Turned on by the challenge, I started working on hauling in hundreds of millions of dollars. After two years, I had my first bill, and within four years, I had collected a gargantuan $11 billion, the bulk of it from half a dozen or so super accounts. I had entered the business a decade before as a grunt, one of thousands of entry-level brokers brought on during a hiring binge by the biggest firms to better compete in the war for billions of dollars in investors' savings. Merrill Lynch fired the first shot in the early 1980s when it hired the renowned consulting firm McKenzie & Company to conduct a top-to-bottom strategic review with an eye toward future growth. Wall Street had come of age as a provider of bespoke and highly sophisticated financial advice reserved for the wealthiest investors and corporations in the world. It had operated this way since its founding in 1817 and continued to do so. Mackenzie determined that Merrill should launch a full-on moonshot, hire and train thousands upon thousands of new brokers in a mad dash for new accounts, and open dozens of new offices to put those new brokers as close as possible to the local investors they hoped to serve. This was in the days before the start of online trading. Whether the newly minted brokers went on to make it in the business mattered far less than how many new accounts they could sign and how much new money they could collect for their firm to manage. If 25% flunked out every year, so be it. The accounts they opened would be left behind for the survivors. Merrill heeded Mackenzie's advice, and the other big investment banks followed suit. Suddenly, a patrician business once filled with elite counselors was brimming with bravado from newcomers with lesser pedigrees who hailed from all walks of life. The big firms wanted to deploy so many people that anyone who could fog a mirror was eligible for hire. Yet quantity is the enemy of quality, as a friend of mine likes to say, quoting a message from a fortune cookie he opened years ago. 
The result, inevitably, was legions of mediocre registered reps, people with no special skills or training in managing other people's money, people who were at best salesmen and who could have been selling most anything, whether stocks or stacks of sheet metal. This struck me now and again, like the time I overheard another broker in the Dallas office put the squeeze on a reluctant client who had said he wanted to confer with his wife before making a final decision. Mr. Jackson, we're not buying drapes here. You don't have to ask your wife, the broker exhorted him. No talk of better returns or tax advantages, just impugn the man's masculinity. It had all the subtlety of a lead pipe cinch, and it came fittingly from the mouth of a broker who had worked previously as a plumber. And yes, his name was Joe, though this was not Joe the plumber who found fleeting fame during Barack Obama's successful presidential run in 2008. With thousands of new brokers to manage, Merrill, Morgan, and the other giants needed to hire branch managers and other bosses. But where to find them? In many cases, they hired from the ranks of the failed brokers who had been culled from the herd, the guys who were less aggressive, less persistent, less creative, less successful. This is the type of advisor now running a lot of branch offices for the big Wall Street firms. They mean well and believe they are doing a bang-up job, and they are delusional. The onrush of new brokers in the late 80s and beyond was followed by a cataclysmic change in 1999. The elimination of the Glass-Steagall Act passed during the failure of 5,000 banks in the Great Depression to impose a separation between investment banking and regular banking. The repeal allowed commercial banks that take in money from the masses to take a bigger role in investing in the volatile markets. When lawmakers lifted Glass-Steagall, the floodgates opened for new financial advisors of all sorts. Suddenly, Actual insurance salesmen, who had no training in finance and investing, were selling mutual funds to their customers. Around this time, I used to spend Saturday mornings at breakfast at the Glen Eagles Country Club in Plano, Texas, meeting with an insurance broker buddy. Over the previous three years, we had developed a synergistic referral loop. He handed me life insurance clients so I could give them investing advice and I handed him investing clients who wanted his insurance advice. Then one Saturday morning he told me, I can't do that anymore. His insurance firm wanted him to sell mutual funds to his clients now, so he wouldn't be referring them to me. But you don't have an idea what you're even talking about, I told him. I know, he told me. They weren't trained in how to do it. They were just told to go out and do it, he explained. So there were thousands of new and untrained rookies in the brokerage business, former insurance salesmen who suddenly had renamed themselves financial advisors, in an even further stretch of the truth. Title inflation taken to the extreme. We were taught to sell. These denizens of Wall Street might be better at doing their jobs if Wall Street were better at training them to do it. Unbeknownst to the public, the dirty little secret of wealth management is that none of us ever were taught how to set up our clients' array of assets, how to spread risk and offset it in equal measure. Portfolio construction, suitability to the client, and managing money were a mystery to us. We were taught to sell. By selling the products our Wall Street overlords told us to sell, we believed we were doing something good for clients— never mind whether the firm's underlying motivation was to generate revenue for themselves. I hoped the story would be different among the ranks of advisors to ultra-high-net-worth clients at Morgan Stanley. As I began courting big blue-chip clients with millions more to invest than I had ever imagined handling, I expected the whole setup would be far superior to what I had seen as a broker on smaller accounts. Surely, I felt, these upper-crust advisors must have conducted deeper research, considered diversified investment options, and sought out sage guidance from veterans with far more experience than I had. And surely they had smarter and safer methods for handling how much risk their clients should assume to get the returns needed to fund their retirement. Those were my hopes. What I found were just nopes. These guys at the top of the food chain 
were really no better at the most important elements of investing their clients' money than the ex-plumbers and other palookas on the phone for the big brokerage houses. No better at assessing risk and tamping it down. No better at figuring out how much money their clients really needed to keep living securely, and no better at diversifying and blending an array of assets in sensible ways. Their biggest shortcoming, as with everyone else on Wall Street, was in managing risk. Given the lamentably lame job that most players on Wall Street do in detecting risk and coming up with ways to quantify it and neutralize it, not to mention the regulators who are supposed to be their masters, it becomes paramount that investors themselves must learn to do it. Imagine setting up your retirement account so that it throws off enough investment income each year to cover all your expenses without your ever having to draw down the principal that you have been building up for your entire career. Designing and setting up this self-perpetuating money machine requires taking on significant risk in the right ways, hedging those bets, and offsetting them with creative and out-of-the-mainstream moves. Before you dare take aim at that target, you must educate yourself to get better at risk identification and assessment and make yourself more comfortable with taking on the right amount of risk so as to maximize returns. That requires a deeper dive into learning about risk and all that it entails. And that is coming up next. <laughs> 